Locked On Podcast Network and Odyssey present Locked On Sports Today. The Miami Dolphins are really good. No, like like 10 touchdowns good. Also, the Cardinals stunned a Cowboys team that was thinking a Super Bowl is in their near future. And all of a sudden, the Saints have to be a little worried. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. I'm Peter Bukowski, starting your day with the can't miss stories and biggest debates in sports. You're locked on sports today. Searching all major sports. Found. Let's start with the biggest story. The Miami Dolphins are 3-0, but they're not just 3-0. In fact, 3-0 as a number times 2 is 60. That's still they scored 10 more points than that on Sunday against the Denver Broncos, 70 to 20 in what I swear was not a college football score. It was an NFL game. Kyle Kraft from Locked on Dolphins joins me now. And Kyle, this was the kind of thing to a tongue by low at 26 or 23 of 26 for 309 and four touchdowns. Doesn't even do justice to how good this Dolphins team was. How, how, did, how did this happen? It's a great question. And I think the the thing that I will joke about is the way that the first two games played this season, they each took about 10 years off of my life with the Chargers game <laughs> and the Patriots game. So to have a game like this is a really nice change of pace. I'm not going to get used to it, but um, you, you look at the rushing offense, 43 attempts for 350 mm. yards and 50 plus yard touchdown run from Devon A. Chain, Chris Brooks, the undrafted free agent that made the team. Rips off a 52-yarder. A-chain was phenomenal. He rushed for 203 yards on 18 attempts in his second career game that he dressed for. That 203 yards was more than the season total for any running back on the Dolphins' 19, 2019 roster. Wow. So that's when this whole thing started. And that's the year that they tore everything down. Mark Walton had the most rushing yards by a running back on that roster for the season with 201. And Devon A-chain just ran for 203 in a game. Uh, you, you may or may not have made that that name up. I, I don't have any recollection of that player playing for the Miami Dolphins. But uh, this was this was a game where the offense was basically perfect. I mentioned 23 of 26, Devon A. Chain 18 for 203, and an eight-yard per carry average on the ground. And that's with Alec Ingold going two for zero and Mike White getting a kneel down. Uh, it's, it's remarkable stuff. There's going to be a discussion now this week, Kyle, about Tua as the MVP favorite, which he was, by the way, coming into this week about separating Tua from Mike McDaniel. I know this is a really long and and thorny question to be asking, but it seems hard for me to to give all the credit to a coach when you go 23 of 26 in an NFL game. Also, I don't know. I I, I hear that question, and I understand why people ask that question, but it does does it matter? Did anybody look at Patrick Mahomes with Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey and Andy Reid and say, yeah, he's great, but... He had two all pros and Andy Reid, so he shouldn't win the MVP. So, like, if the season total, if you get to the end of the road and the season total is what the season total is, it doesn't matter. Like, he he would be the guy in the offense. And if you want proof of concept of what it looks like without Tua, look at the record last year when the games that Tua didn't play. Yeah. Look at the offensive output in the games last year in which Tua didn't play. It's it's less about a translatability to another quarterback. And it's about how tailored and specific the offense is to this quarterback. And that's thing. That's a thing teams should do more of. And to ding the quarterback for that, for saying, well, he's in a uh, tailored suit. Yeah. That's the, that's why you get it tailored. That's the entire <laughs> point is to do that. So I hear the question. I understand he's a polarizing player for a lot of people because he's not a traditional orthodox this is what an NFL quarterback looks like or feels like or plays like when they're an elite player. But this offense, when it's all of the components that multiply and compound off of each other, this is the kind of explosiveness that you get. By the way, Jalen Waddle didn't even play in this game. Yeah, that that is, I think, something that we cannot gloss over. Also, not to be glossed over is the defense. Until the fourth quarter, the Broncos had scored just 13 points. They got that, that last seven to just make it a little, I guess, I guess a little more aesthetically pleasing, but 
in a game where you're on pass script the entire time and could certainly just be playing prevent defense and doing all that stuff, the, the Dolphins' defense came through. What did you see from them in this game? I uh, really like the way that Javon Holland f- hunted the football. You know, he, he stripped Cortland Sutton twice. Uh, they pressured Russell Wilson 20 times. They were persistent with pressure. They only sacked him once. Uh, but that's that's kind of the Vic Fangio soft, not concede explosive plays with Jerry Judy and Marvin Mims, who had that 98-yard kickoff return for a touchdown or whatever the, the yardage was on that. He's an explosive player, and I think they were really committed to, and you saw Russell try to take a couple shots down the field, one on the sideline, one right down the middle of the field down the pipe, and the safety almost intercepted it both times. So you saw them play soft, and behind that you saw some intermediate throws. If Russ was able to get through his progressions, there was yardage, there was bend, don't break. They get down into the red zone. The defense buckles down. The Dolphins go for it on their own 35-yard line on a fourth and one and try to run fullback Alec Ingold up the middle. They they turn it over on downs, and the Broncos' offense goes backwards and forces a punt. Stay up to date all year on the Miami Dolphins by subscribing to Locked On Sports today and Locked On Dolphins on your favorite podcast app and on YouTube. Thanks for making Locked On Sports today your first listen. Coming up, the Cowboys had their eyes on the hopeful horizon and missed the Cardinals right in front of their nose. Before we get to that, the Steelers went west for a showdown with the Raiders. Snap into action this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get $200 back in bonus bets guaranteed. Now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is easy to use and you can bet on everything from spreads to player props and more. Tonight's Rams-Bengals game has seen a lot of movement on that line, probably because it's a coin flip as to whether Joe Burrow is going to play Right now, FanDuel has the Bengals as one and a half point favorites at home. You can also combine bets within the same game to make even more money. Same game parlays are a great way to enjoy any game. Get your $200 in bonus bets, win or lose now. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season with an offer you won't want to miss. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. The Raiders hosted the Steelers on Sunday night. I'm Chris Carter, the Locked On Steelers podcast, and your Pittsburgh Steelers have won against the Las Vegas Raiders 23-18 at Allegiant Stadium. The Steelers now 2-1 and and in sole possession of first place in the AFC North. It was a true team win by the Pittsburgh Steelers, and I think that's the biggest thing that you could take positively out of this game because you could say good things about both the offense and the defense and special teams. Let's start with the offense. Kenny Pickett comes out 16 of 28, 235 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions, a pass rating of 108.5, but you can't overlook the defense that had three interceptions, four sacks, and a turnover on downs forced. This was a really impressive showing for a defense, and a defense, I'll say, that also had to put up with some shaky calls at times. When the game was starting to be put away and the Steelers were taking control, Minka Fitzpatrick had a huge sack on Jimmy Garoppolo. Yes, there was a little touching of the helmets there, but it wasn't a forcible contact. Even NBC's referees on on TV were saying that was a terrible call by the officials there that swayed the game in the Raiders' favor on top of the uh, passing interference called on Shandon Sullivan in in the end zone. There were lots of things that looked shaky there, but I think the really good thing is that the defense did not lose their composure. The Baltimore Ravens saw a controversial no call lead to an overtime loss to the Indianapolis Colts. Man, what a what a fun game. What a fun game. You know, we were saying all week on this show that we just needed the Colts to win ugly. This game, if the Colts are going to win this game against a really really good team, they needed to win ugly, and this was a disgusting game. It was straight nasty. It was ugly. Neither offense was really getting anything going. There was fumbles from the Ravens. The Colts almost lost a fumble. There was a step out the back of your own end zone safety by the Indianapolis Colts. Just an ugly, ugly game. But the Colts were able to come out of this game victorious against a really good Ravens team. So uh, just hats off to the coaching staff for the Colts. Hats off to the you know the offense for getting it done at the very end there. The defense for just carrying the load the entire game. The Chargers got back on the right track against the Vikings, who are now 0-3. Well, it is never easy, Chargers fans, but they found a way to get it done late against the Vikings. This is Daniel Wade here from Locked On Chargers, coming to you after the Chargers 
24 thrilling victory over the Minnesota Vikings and this game came down to the final seconds and it was Kenneth Murray who came away with the game winning interception in a game that the Chargers defense had some terrible lapses but back to back goal line stands to go win this game for the Chargers after Brandon Staley decided to go for it on fourth and one from his own 24 but it doesn't get done without the special connection between Justin Herbert and his star receiver Keenan Allen. Justin Herbert gets his first ever 400 yard passing game in this one in Keenan Allen, 18 catches, 215 yards, insanity. And for the Chargers, there's a lot to work on, but Chargers fans, you have to be happy with this win for the full game breakdown. Make sure to check out the Locked On Chargers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Turns out when you win a million games by one score, like the Vikings did last year, that these things tend to find their water level. They're 0-3 in one score games this season. And the Phillies swept the Mets as they get ready for the playoffs. <laughs> it's a sweep for the Philadelphia Phillies, folks. Connor Thomas, your host of Locked On Phillies. I'm outside in the rain right now. It is uh, not great weather here in Philadelphia. Glad they could get the games in. And Christopher Sanchez was awesome. It was great to see that. Uh, I love what the Phillies did in this series against the New York Mets. It's a lesser team. You have more to play for. Not only do you eliminate them for playoff contention, they were gone anyway, but actually end their season. And then you have a four-game sweep in the middle of a playoff race. Top wild card seed. You're going to be able to lock that up. And the Phillies have done what they needed to do. You play a lesser team on your home field. You should go out and take at least three of those games in a four-game series. They go out and take all four. Love it. The broom will be out on tomorrow's episode. And the Phillies are getting hot at the right time. Nick Castellano is getting hot at the right time. I love everything I'm seeing. We'll talk more on the next episode of Locked on Phillies. Coming into the season, the Arizona Cardinals were viewed by a lot of people. I think the national narrative around the Arizona Cardinals was this was the Caleb Williams team. They were going to be the worst team in the league. There was embarrassing social media clips about new head coach Jonathan Gannon, and they are now the owners of one of the most surprising wins of the season, a 28-16 handling of the Dallas Cowboys, who a lot of people, myself included, thought was the best team in the NFL, Alex Clancy from Locked on Cardinals always has that fire in his gut, whether he took the bus to work or not. <laughs> Real ones are going to get that one. Alex, how how did Arizona do this? Um, they're well coached. And I, and I think that it's very simple. You can see a very stark contrast between the last four seasons with a lot of talent and today with none. I mean, this is like the Lifetime Achievement Award for Jonathan Gannon for the first three weeks of this season. <laughs> yeah. They, they could be three and up. Like they really could. Like with zero talent, they've got a great offensive coordinator in Drew Petzing, who's never done it before. They've got a great defensive coordinator in Nick Rollis, who's 30, who's never done it before. And Jonathan Gannon may be weird, but so is Mike McDaniel. Who cares? If they can coach, they can coach. Yeah, and they're doing this with a quarterback in Josh Dobbs that they picked up four minutes before the week one kickoff after unceremoniously cutting the quarterback we all assumed was going to be the starter. And, and I, I don't know, am I crazy? Has Josh Dobbs looked pretty good through three weeks? He's played six perfect quarters of football out of eight at state farm stadium. The last two weeks, not Kyle Shanahan isn't the only one who could write up an offense and have a quarterback who may be a little bit lesser than execute it. He's been composed. The offensive line has played well, especially, you know, it was a little bit different today, but one of the best fronts in football were on the, was on the other side of the ball. Joshua Dobbs has been a very, very pleasant surprise. He's already ingratiated himself as an Arizona Cardinal. He'll be the backup when Kyler Murray comes back. And that's what I can't stop thinking is, man, this offense is going to be wild with Kyler Murray calling the shots. Does how this first three weeks play out affect the way that you think they will handle this upcoming tank for Caleb Williams, Drake May, and this is a loaded quarterback class. Does does this this set of performances, do you think, change the way that they view this? This is proof of concept. You know, I mean, that's what, the, that's what it's going to be until Kyler Murray comes back. What is this offense going to look like? What is this defense going to look like? You can tell. I mean, you and I joke a lot about the Cardinals and being the butt of jokes, which is warranted, and I'm usually on your side with them. This is an adult football team. Small yeah. sample size, but it's a stark difference from what we've seen up until this point. And I'll tell you what, I'd much rather have Chicago stock right now for the Caleb Williams with them in Carolina than the Cardinals in Houston from what we saw from C.J. Stroud and the Cardinals today at home. So moving forward, all joking aside, go win football games. 
go win football games. I think perhaps the most surprising thing, well, it's all surprising to me, but this defensive performance, it, nine passes defense against Dak Prescott and this offense, like I know Trayvon Diggs hurt his ACL. That's not that's not uh, the the Cardinals defense's problem. He doesn't play offense for Dallas. <laughs> and yet this this defense has gone out and, and played some really good football in this game. That's supposed to be Gannon's calling card. How did they get it done? Shorthanded, no Buda Baker. He's on IR. Like this, you mentioned the no talent thing. Like I look around this defense, and I'm like, who are half these guys? And yet they played awesome. Yeah, there are two keys to this. One, a pass rush makes everything easier. Everything. I mean, this this cornerback room is not good. I mean, no. Marco Wilson played fine. Control Clark's a sixth round pick. He played fine. He's a rookie playing in the NFL, playing many more meaningful snaps under the spotlight than he should be right now. Zayvon Collins moved to his more traditional role of edge rusher. The pass rush is getting home, maybe not with sack totals. I think they have nine. I Don't quote me on that, but they've got a bunch of sacks through the first handful of weeks. And Nick Rallis has these guys in a system that works their skill set. And I will tell you, the unsung move this offseason was bringing over Kazir White on a two-year, very team-friendly deal to play inside linebacker, to play the heartbeat of this defense that he knows so well, making it to the Super Bowl in Philadelphia with Nick Rallis and Jonathan Gannon the year prior. He's what everybody wanted Isaiah Simmons to be, and he was immediately, and it makes everything work so much more simply. Stay up to date on the Arizona Cardinals by subscribing to Locked On Sports today and Locked On Cardinals on your favorite podcast app and on YouTube. Coming up, should the Saints fans be worried? Through three quarters, the New Orleans Saints were dominating Jordan Love and the Green Bay Packers. It was 17 to nothing at halftime and then 17 to nothing through three quarters. But Jordan Love and company put up 18 points in the fourth quarter to stun the New Orleans Saints, who also saw Derek Carr leave the game in that third quarter. Ross Jackson joins me now from Lambeau Field, where the Packers got their 11th straight home opening win to start the season. Ross, what happened in the second half and really just the fourth quarter to this Saints team? Yeah, it was really interesting because, look, Green Bay didn't really change what they were doing. They just started taking more of those downfield shots. And the New Orleans Saints clearly uh, did not respond well to being challenged in, in that way. And, and that was something that we haven't really seen them have to sort of, you know, muster up at any point over the course of the first two games. The Saints have done a good job just keeping those 20 plus yard air yard plays, those big explosive plays at bay. But once Green Bay got to the points where they felt comfortable taking their shots downfield, it really challenged the New Orleans Saints. And so I think some of it comes down to technique. Other pieces of it come down to some eye discipline issues, which we've seen for this New Orleans Saints defense before as well penalties uh, you know panicking a little bit with the ball in the air maybe I don't know it, it was really really challenging uh, for them and it was a, a frustrating thing to watch if you're a New Orleans Saints fan to see this New Orleans Saints defense which has been so good and still hasn't allowed a team to score more than 20 points uh, all of a sudden come to life in the fourth quarter when it mattered most to be able to put a game away yeah they hadn't they had allowed one touchdown in two games this season they allowed two in the fourth quarter alone mm -hmm. and what we're among league leaders in not allowing teams to throw the ball 10 yards down the field yep. and then all of a sudden in the fourth quarter the packers started to hit some of those shots let's flip that around then from an opponent's standpoint as you're watching the packers put this together without david bakhtiari without christian watson without aaron jones without elton jenkins what did you make of what you saw from this really young, really inexperienced Packers team? Uh, a resilient team and a team that, you know, decided that it was going to play four quarters. And I think that's a big thing, right? Like when you have a team that's down at halftime, 17 to zero, it's a three score game. Maybe you feel the need not to play this two the two quarters. Look, this is a team that's got a division opponent, the, the Detroit Lions, just a couple of days away from this game. And the Green Bay Packers being a young team could have been in a situation to where they kind of, you know, allowed themselves to, to fall asleep at the wheel for the second half, but avoided doing that and instead continued you to fight and you see why teams never give up until the clock hits zero Rashawn Gary had three sacks in this game and none more important than the one that knocked Derek Carr out of this game Derek Carr was 13 of 18 for 103 and a touchdown seemed to be in pretty good command of this Saints offense when he left the game where do we stand right now with Derek Carr because this is a, a two and one Saints team now that looks like they will still be squarely in the playoff mix in the NFC 
Yeah, yeah. I don't think that this is a team that's necessarily going anywhere as long as they don't lose Derek Carr for an extended amount of time. And it looks like losing Derek Carr for an extended amount of time is not going to be the case. Uh, according to Ian Rapport over at NFL Network, uh, Derek Carr avoided major structural damage. He's dealing with an AC sprain. So everything in terms of playing time comes down to when the swelling goes down and when he has the mobility to be able to get the ball out. The issue is that it's his right shoulder. It is his yeah. throwing shoulder. So with that being the case, that means that it's not a situation where you go, okay, well, the swelling's still there a little bit, but it's playable. No, you're not playing this guy until the swelling goes down. So I would expect still some potential missed time for the quarterback who's only missed two games due to injury in his entire career. Wow. But the good news is that there's we're not looking at a long-term or potentially even season-ending situation for Derek Carr and the New Orleans Saints. So it's positive from that front. Stay up to date on the New Orleans Saints by subscribing to Locked On Sports today and Locked On Saints on your favorite podcast app and on YouTube. And finally, Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey aren't dating. Or so that's what has been said. Then Taylor showed up with Kelsey's mom in a suite at Sunday's 41-10 Chiefs win over the Bears in Kansas City. Chiefs quarterback Patrick Mahomes said after the game, I heard she was in the house. I felt a little bit of pressure. I knew I had to get it to Trav. He did. And of course, they showed T-Swift in the box going absolutely nuts. This is going to be a story. This is going to stay a story. Thanks for making Locked On Sports today your first listen. Now go find your favorite team's Locked On podcast and make them your second listen. Coming up on the next Locked On Sports today, will the Bengals be all but eliminated from this year's AFC playoff picture after Monday Night Football? So at least until tomorrow, stay locked on sports today. Locked On Podcast Network and Odyssey present Locked On Sports Today. 